Praise the Lord. Welcome those who watch us from different parts of the world and different parts of the state and different parts of our county and our fellowship. Welcome you in the name of Jesus. Psalm 50, Psalm 50, the acceptable sacrifice, another Psalm of Asaph. Uh, this is where I believe the Lord has led us tonight, and um, I believe it'll, it'll speak to all of our hearts. Another Psalm of a man who very, very little is known about him, but tremendous wisdom. In fact, the Lord allowed him to write several Psalms, and this is his first one. We read one of his yes, uh, last week, Psalm 73. Tonight will be in his, uh, the one that's not in, included in book three. We're going to be in book two, Psalm 50, a Psalm of Asaph. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this man, this man who was stirred by the Spirit to write things that in that time, in that culture, and to that people might have been uh, very, very uh, troubling and disturbing by what he wrote. But Lord, he wrote by the Spirit, and it was what you had for him to write. It's for them, it's for us, and it's a way for us to remember, Lord, how you see us. Many times we can see things in a particular way that may seem right in our own eyes, but Lord, when you, we see it through your eyes, we get a different picture, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for your uh, wake-up calls. We thank you for your warnings. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you don't want to leave us on our own, to our own demise, but you prepare us and you make us more like your son, Jesus. That's the end goal, and we thank you for that. Thank you for this man who, in the midst of singing and worship and how many people can get caught up in the emotion, he wrote some very truthful things and some, very th and some hard things that were sung in a song, and, and yet it brought people to repentance. Lord, thank you for Asaph. Thank you for your word. And we ask you by the same spirit that move Asaph, you will stir us up to not only obey your word and, and do what it says, but also, Lord, to communicate it to other people that need your word. But, Lord, help us to look at us first. Look in our hearts and look in our uh, way of worship. And, Lord, and see if you're pleased. We ask you and thank you for, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The writer of the Psalms, Psalm 73, a famous psalm. It's the same writer that we'll be reading today, Psalm 50. And, of course, the book of Psalms, wonderful book. Jesus said it was about himself. So when we read the Psalms, we're reading about Jesus. What a wonderful study he would have been given to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. On the road to Emmaus, he spoke to them for some time about things concerning the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And we read last week that uh, many, many authors in the book of Psalms, over, 150, uh, over 145 Psalms, 150 total, and many of them written by David. But not just David. We're going to look at probably the one that has the second most. There's 50 anonymous one, but we know 12 of them were written by this man named Asaph. And Asaph was a wise man. And he was called by many names in the Bible. In fact, uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 25, we read this last time, but it's good to be reminded of uh, Asaph and what he meant to the Jewish people at the time. 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 1. 1 Chronicles 25 verse 1. Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph, and of Haman and of Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, cymbals, and a number of those who perform their services. So Asaph was a man who was a choir director. He wrote many psalms, but he also led the singing and the worship in the tabernacle. And of course, he was responsible for, if you will read all the passages relating to Asaph, he was responsible for about 250 singers. A hundred of them played instruments, and he was wonderfully blending all the orchestra together. From Sabbath to Sabbath, he led the worship of God in the tabernacle. And Israel was at a time of great peace and great prosperity. People that would come every week and week in and week out. And it was a wonderful time of worship and praise. Of course, he was a Levite, and uh, he was a man who wrote many of the Psalms. His name, his name means to collect or to gather, as in to keep adding on to things that are written. And of course, Asaph 
wrote things that included many wonderful things that God added to the children of Israel. So his name meant exactly what he did. He added to the Psalms. He added to a collection of songs. Remember, the Psalms are songs. And he was able to gather all of God's word that he was given to him, and he was able to bring it in a form of what they call oracles. And we're going to talk about that in a moment, because many of the Psalms, just like David's Psalm, God intervenes in, through his writing, and they become oracles, meaning God speaking in those Psalms in the first person. And so he was a Levite, he was in charge, he was a choir director, and during this time, many sacrifices, of course, were offered, uh, a time of worship was done, other priests helped along as well, they were the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were uh, the small group of Levites, descendants from the rebellion of Korah, and they began to create other psalms as well, and they're also comp uh, composed many psalms, Psalm 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, many of them written by the sons of Korah. And of course, they had a king. They had a king who was also a psalmist, David. He wrote many psalms, the most psalms, and he supplied the music for the children of Israel as well. And at first, they met in a tabernacle-like setting, but they were preparing for a temple. So soon enough, these, these priests move into a temple worship when Solomon was around, and everything seems to be going great. Isn't it wonderful when God's people come together and sing together and worship together and the sacrifices are made, and the congregation just seems to be right, and everything seems to be right, and the sun is shining, and it's 73 degrees outside, and you just feel like, I could always just live here because God's word is so good. Now, Asaph was just not only a choir singer, we read about that, but he was also in charge of many of the, th of the, of, of the, the, the worship of God as a choir director, but he was also a seer. He was also a seer. And we find that in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 30, that he was called a seer. After he had died, King Hezekiah ordered the Levites to the, sing the praises, the songs of David and Asaph, and he was called the seer. And of course, when they even came back from the temp, from Babylon into the new temple, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 12, uh, David and the musician Asaph, long ago the musicians have led the songs and praises of God at Thanksgiving. They used Asaph's songs, but he was a seer. Notice that, he was a seer. And a seer... It's like a prophet. It's the word seer. It's one who sees. Not just seeing things, but seeing things for what they really are. An insight. A discernment, you would say. A prophet. A one who, one who sees things that nobody else seems to notice. And the prophets were very good at doing that. In fact, some of them saw visions. Visions in the night, like Zechariah. Or visions like Ezekiel. Men of God who wrote things that they saw. They were seers. And this was a man who saw things as well. So in the line of prophets and seers, Asaph is one of them. And he saw things that were quite interesting and quite unique, especially the worship of God. And he saw it. And he saw it, and God spoke to him. One day God spoke to him, and he said, Asaph, things are not what they seem to be. They may seem so wonderful to you, but I want you to look at him from my perspective. And Asaph was a seer, and he saw what God actually saw when people were worshiping and sacrificing. And of course, in an Old Testament, in an Old Testament sense, they were bringing their sacrifices to God. And Asaph saw it through God's eye, and he was able to say, so, uh, was able to write Psalm 50. So, some unique things about Psalm 50 that we need to pay attention to as before we get into it is God speaks directly. It's one of the Psalms that God speaks directly in the first person. God says, I'm the one who's doing this. I'm the one who's telling you this. It's not a prophet writing about what God said. It's God directly speaking through the prophet and saying, I will do this. The names for God are used, three of them. In fact, in one verse, you find the names of God. El, Elohim, and Yahweh are used, very unique to find them in one verse. I said, well, that means much to you. But it's very, very important, especially to Israel and the covenant relationship they had with them. The other one is we find the word Selah again after verse 6. And it's quite unique to see those. They don't appear in every psalm. But when they do appear, we pay attention. The tablets of the law are going to be mentioned here. 
And it's going to be in a unique way because God is reminding them, God is reminding them that um, they need to remember the Word of God. They need to remember the Word of God. By the way, uh, a couple of other names appear. I didn't write it down there. Uh, for God, Elion and Eloah are also mentioned in this psalm. So five different names for God and titles for God and names of God are in this psalm. So it's, it's really pregnant with meaning. And the tablets of the law, meaning that uh, this, is, this is an important thing to remember. From verses 8 through 15, it's all about the first tablet of the law, which deals with our vertical relationship with God. From verses 16 through 21, deals with the horizontal relationship between man and man. And that's what the second tablet of the law, of the Decalogue, it is for. So the first tablet, our relationship with God, that's mentioned in the first part of the psalm, our relationship to one another. It's mentioned in the second half of the psalm, and it's as part of the second tablet. Confuse you enough? Well, you'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now, it is broken up into four parts. The book is very simple. The song or the psalm is very simple. There's only four parts. The first part, you'll see it, a judge walks into his courtroom. A judge walks into his courtroom. And it's not any judge. It's the judge of all the earth. And he's not judging the world, as you might have thought, or maybe the Jewish people would have thought. He doesn't come to Sinai. He comes to Zion. And who lived in Zion? God's people. So who has he come to judge? His own people. And that would have been a shock to them because the last people they thought God would judge would be themselves. And he brings a charge. So there are two charges that God brings, like any good court uh, drama or any good court official, you have to bring the charges. And there are two charges that God brings. The first charge is about the sacrifices. And the second charge is a rebellion against the law of God. But like any good and merciful God, he offers a solution. He offers a solution at the end. And Asaph was in charge of bringing this word that God was not pleased with the worship and sacrifice of his people, even though everything seems to be going so well, the singing, the sacrifices were doing fine. And it just seems like, why would Asaph write something like this? Why trouble the people? Just let them be. Let them be happy. But God wasn't happy with them. Before we get started in the Psalms, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 1, please. Isaiah chapter 1, the prophet Isaiah. This psalm has a very good correlation to this prophet who wrote about the same thing, almost the exact same thing, but further down the road in the timeline of the nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 1, and let's look at verse 10. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Because the people of God had become so in love with their religion, with their religion and their sacrifices, they believe it was an end to themselves, meaning that as long as they were doing the sacrifices, they should be good. God told us to do the sacrifices. God uh, installed the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices. So God must be pleased because he told us to do this. He, he's supposed to be pleased with our sacrifices. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, he wasn't talking about Sodom. He was talking to Israel. But just, you can kind of imagine uh, why Isaiah would call them Sodom. You give instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Well, that's, that would have been a, a very much a slap in the face because those two nations are known in the ancient world even to this, to this day. We have uh, a word that is in, uh, included in our English vocabulary, sodomy, to explain immorality. And yet Isaiah is calling God's people immoral people. What are, you, uh, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, the Lord says? I've had enough of your burnt offerings and the fat of the, fa uh, the, fat of the fat cattle. I take no pleasure in the, in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come near uh, to appear before me, who requires of your trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings, no longer incense and abomination to me. New moons and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies. I can't endure your iniquity of the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon, your festivals, and your appointed feast. And they become a burden to me. I am weary 
on bearing them. You have spread out your hands in prayer. I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen to you. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease from doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove those who are ruthless. Defend those who are weak. The orphan. Plead for the widow. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they will be white as wool. What a wonderful chapter. But what a wonderful man to write things to the nation of Israel who was at his heyday. He was in his heyday. He said, why is Isaiah so, you know, downing on our day? We should be the, we're the people of God. We're bringing sacrifices. And God says, you know what? Don't bring them anymore. Don't bring him anymore because you are hypocritically worshiping me. Your hands are full of blood. You are not doing what I've called you to do. Yes, you do the sacrifices, but they're actually weary. They're weary. I'm tired of them. And it's exactly the point that Asaph brings. So Isaiah and Asaph, very close together. And we'll see another young man, which Asaph influenced tremendously at the end of this book. So let's look at the first part. Let's look at verse 1 through 6 of Psalm 50. Psalm 50, back to Psalm 50, the first six verses. The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken. See those three names? Three names of God, three in one. The mighty one, God, the Lord. So Yahweh, El, and Elohim, all in one sentence. Very unique in, in the Hebrew Bible. And so a very good Jewish boy would have said, oh, pay attention, perks you up. God's trying to get my attention. He's using all of his names on the same sentence. It's like for us to say three and one, one and three, right? It's, it's the fullness of the Godhead speaking to us. God has spoken, and he's summoning all the earth from all the rising of the sun to its setting therefore. Out of Zion, the perfect beauty has gone forth, has shined forth. May our God come and not keep silent. Fire devours before him. It's a very tempestuous or a tempest all around him. He summons the, hev uh, the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is the judge. And we're supposed to say, Selah. Let's stop and think about this. And remember, Selah was a word, and many commentators argue about what the real meaning of it. Nobody really knows the total meaning of it. We can gather from how it's used that it was a pause for the worship team to stop playing. Remember, this is a choir director who, as they're singing this song, so you would have sung it, he would have said, stop the music, and let's think about what we just said. Because isn't that amazing? We can come as Christians, we can go to church for such a long time, sing all the songs, you know all the hymns, but have you ever thought about the hymns that you're singing? We'll get to that because they had the same problem. They would sing and sing and sing and sing, and they just became repetitive and mechanical, and they never thought about, hey, I'm actually singing about repenting, but I'd never do it. And that's one of the things that happens when we know so much about God and so much about the Bible, and we forget to do this. So his own people, and the scene is a courtroom, has seen as a courtroom, and there's like an any good courtroom, there are people that are going to be tried. His own people, he says. But before you get too haughty on the Jews, when we look at the Israelites, we also look at the church. We get our bifocals. And when we look at the people of God in the old, we got to say who's the people of God also in the new. He's included us in his tree, his olive tree. We'll get back to that on Sundays with Paul. And he is including us in it. We learn from Israel. The things that was written to them are written for us, for our learning and for our edification, for our hope and promise, but also for the warnings. So as we walk through the psalm, we're going to see this in a very real way. Walking through the psalms, in particular Psalm 50, is going to speak to our hearts. It's going to speak to us as Christians, not just to them, to the Jews, but for us as Christians to say, what is my heart like in prayer? What is my heart like in worship? Am I bringing the sacrifice that God wants us to bring? And of course, we're not talking animal sacrifices anymore, but the only one true sacrifice God is pleased with. And I would encourage you, if you, if you want to read more about this, because we can only cover so much uh, in one hour or so, 
people start looking at the clock after a while, especially online. They start dropping off after an hour. Is you should read this book on your own. John Bunyan, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress, The Acceptable Sacrifice, which is the title of our message today, so we borrowed it from John. Uh, his wonderful book about a broken heart, about the excellency of following the Lord after him convicting us of sin and drawing us to himself. We get to the breaking point of following God, and now we commit wholeheartedly to him. It's a wonderful book. Get a hold of it. Sell your shirt. Go buy it, and you get one. The Acceptable Sacrifice. Back to Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 50, verse 1. The Lord is speaking, and he summons everyone. So this is a jury, and if you've been to any, any juror, any courtroom, you could see that there are places where everybody sits. And, of course, the place where God sits is the judge. He is the judge, and he's coming in, and, of course, any judge, the, uh, he is highly lifted up. In any courtroom, he is the center of the courtroom, and he's elevated because he sees, sees it all, and he's the one that brings about the charges and, of course, the resolution as well. But we've got to think of it in the ancient world. In the ancient world, we don't think of a courtroom like this, but we think of something like this. And the ancient Israelites had a courtroom, a court system, but it wasn't in a room. It was a, the city gates. You take it to the city gates, to the elders, and they were the ones who uh, administered God's justice. The priest uh, would go there, and they would know the law of God. They would trust God for his solution, and they would make a decision. And so they were the judge, and they were the jury as well. But in this situation, there is no jury. There is no, I would say, um, uh, the judge, the lawyer, the jury are all the same person. It's God. Why? You don't need anybody else because God's the one who's perfect justice and perfect righteousness and goodness. So the judge, he's sitting there with all his glory and he summons, it says in Psalm 2, in Psalm 1, sorry, summons the earth from the rising of the sun out of Zion. He goes to Zion, not to the other place he's been. He's been to a lot of places, but it says that the Lord, perfect beauty, and God has shined forth, the perfection of beauty. God's light is shining. And of course, in the Bible, God's light, we love the light. We love the truth. But in biblical ideas, the light is to expose us. The light is to bring us to being exposed to God's light. Being exposed to God's light is a very, very scary thing. You might not want to see what's in there. You might not want to see what God has shined forth, and what he shines forth is, of course, our sins and our motives and our hearts. Jesus said there's a day that's coming where everything that's done in darkness will be exposed to the light, and that'll be for every unbeliever as well as for every believer. Everything we've done will come to light, and here tonight in our, uh, in our fellowship, as people are watching, whatever they've done, whatever you're doing, Know, my friend, that one day it'll come to light 100%, whether good or whether bad. Every woman, every man will come to that light. And, of course, John the Apostle wrote in his first letter, before we can know that God is love, he says, God is light. God is purity, ultimate holiness and purity. And whatever we have done will be exposed on that day. So guess what God is doing? He is coming to expose he is coming to shine a light onto the situation. And his procession is pretty amazing because it says in verse 3, may our God come. You know, a judge walks into a, a courtroom. Well, God is walking into his courtroom. And he cannot keep silence. Why? Because fire devours before him and a tempest goes around him. This is exactly what we find in the book of Exodus. So let's turn to Exodus because this is a powerful scene that the book of, uh, the book of Psalm is bringing us. Exodus 19, uh, Asaph is writing something very deep at the heart of the children of Israel, which is the Exodus. And in Exodus 19, a beautiful chapter, a very scary chapter. In fact, the children of Israel ran from God when the fire and the earthquake on the mountain was that day was so heavy that they ran and they said, Moses, you talk to God. We don't want to talk to God. He's scary. And rightly so, because the mountain caught fire, there was earthquakes, there was a tempest. Jewish history even tells us that there was a whirlwind going up there. It was quite a phenomenal sight. 
Chapter 19, verse 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning. There's a lot of allusions here to the day of the resurrection, the day of revelation of God, that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain. Uh, of course, that was a symbolic of the, the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. And a very loud trumpet sound to all the people who were encamped and tremble. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountains. What a sight that might have been. Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it with fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain was shaken violently. And when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Now, this was exactly the scene that the psalmist is, is, is picturing here. God is summoning us and he comes with fire and this is reminiscent of Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, that, that scene, that dreadful scene to the children of Israel because they had sinned against God and God was at the top of the mountain and he had come down and the whole mountain was on fire. This is repeated again in Exodus 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 4, that fear of God, knowing who you're dealing with. He is a consuming fire. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There was a guy named Marcion, not Martian, but Marcion in the early church, and he didn't like that verse. He didn't like the fact that God was a consuming fire uh, in the Old Testament. And he made up this idea that the God of the Old Testament was a different God in the New Testament, that Jesus was meek and mild, and the God of the Old was very harsh and judgmental. So he started ignoring the Old Testament. Well, he came to a verse like this, and he had trouble with this. Verse 28 of chapter 12, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we receive the kingdom, kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us grow in gratitude, but which may be offered to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. And Marcion didn't like that verse, so he started cutting it out. And he got to Revelation 19 when Jesus makes war with the United Nations. And he didn't like that either. And he started cutting it out as well. And all of a sudden, he found himself cutting things right out of the Bible. Old Testament, now the New Testament. Why? Because it's the, he didn't realize it's the same God. The same God that was quaking the Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. It's the same God who has come to visit us in the person of Jesus and in the person of the Holy Spirit. As this is very much reminiscent of Acts chapter 2, isn't it? The fire of God upon the people and the mighty rushing wind of God in Acts chapter 2. And they give utterance. He gave utterance to people to speak the word of God in power and in the Holy Spirit. Just as fire came out of the altar and consumed Aaron's son because of their, their uh, strange fire in numbers. It's the same fire that deals with us in our hearts and minds and empowers us to do the same thing. So which one is it? It's both. It's the consuming fire. It cons it'll consume anything. It'll consume sin. It'll consume the dross. It'll consume all the things that he's not pleased with. So when we come to God, we approach God in a very reverential way, in awe, knowing that he is the same God who loves us. And yet we can sit at that mountain and go, wow, our God is a consuming fire. I fear God. I'm in awe of God. But I love God and he loves me. And therefore, there's that perfect balance of Old and New Testament to come to that reality that it's the same God. Let's go back to Psalm 50 because uh, he's just getting warmed up and I'm getting warmed up too. It's the fact that it's a public thing. This is not some hiding thing. Nobody's doing it behind a courtroom, behind, a, behind some room or in a private chamber. He gathers all his people. Look at verse 4. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. That idea here is it's basically the heavenly hosts, all the angels. They'll come and watch the heavens and then the earth beneath. This is not the day of the Lord. This is not the day of the Lord. This is the day where God is going to judge his people. We can see here in verse 5, God, gather my godly ones, my godly ones, those who've made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Who are these godly ones? And of course, in the Old Testament, they were the children of Israel. Of course, this is referring to those who God has made a covenant with. This is not the day of the Lord. This is God's dealing with his people. 
The book of Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. This is an amazing verse. In 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 17, it tells us that the judgment begins in the house of the Lord. When God is going to judge the world, he will first deal with his people. He will purify the sons of Israel. He'll purify the children of God. He will purify those who are his. Before he does anything to the world, he will cleanse his church. He will deal with his people. And you could see it here in the Psalms. It's interesting. He doesn't go to Mount Sinai again. God goes to Zion. You see that part there? God is in Zion. Verse 2, Zion. Of course, the book of Hebrews tells us we have come to heavenly, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to heavenly Zion. There's a spiritual Zion there that the earthly one represented. We've come to Zion, but we have to come through first the light of God and God exposing that which we think it's right. And God brings us to the point where he says, okay, guess who's in the box? Guess who's in the docket? Guess who is being tried in the courtroom? And you would automatically say it's the unbeliever, it's the atheist, it's the LGBT crowd, it's Nancy Pelosi's, exactly. It is not them first. Oh, they'll get their part. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the book of Hebrews says. However, he says, let's deal with us first. Let's deal with his own people. How can you say such a thing, Asaph? Asaph, how, you know, the, so the shocking thing is, remember, this is a song, and they're going to sing this song next week. It's like if Christian or Sergio or one of the worship guys would write a song, and, and it'll be an indictment to the church of Jesus in the New Testament. How can you sing such a song? Can't you sing a happy song? Can't you sing a happy, clappy song, and everybody gets along? Why would you have to write such a song that deals with our hearts and our sins? Jesus said, not all on that day will say, uh, not all who say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, will be able to enter the kingdom of God. He judges and he sees our hearts. That's Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will be saved that day. And it's because God loves us. He wants us to deal with the very thing in our hearts, the very sin that he sees, that he sees. And so the congregation comes to worship. They hear the sh uh, they're going to hear this song, and what a shock. Asaph, remember, he's a seer. He's seeing this from God. He's getting this vision from God, this idea. God is dealing with us, and God is going to present a legal indictment. So if you're a lawyer, if you like law, this is, this is kind of interesting. In the Bible, it's called a charge or a dispute. A charge or a dispute. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 1, God brings a charge. Hosea 4, 1. God brings a charge in a dispute with the children of Israel, meaning that they've done something and God is calling them out. God is calling them out. In this age of non-confrontationalism, God is not afraid to confront us with our sin. The ones with the covenant, God says, the ones with the covenant. And of course, this is a covenant that was made in this mountain. What was the covenant? Well, in this mountain, after the sacrifice was made in Egypt, the lamb that was, that was sacrificed and the blood was put on the altar, he brought them out through the Red Sea into this mountain. And they walked the further out to the mountain, Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And God made a covenant there and he gave them his word. What were his words? Ten commandments. Thou shalt follow me, first tablet dealing with God, no other gods, no graven images, and then dealing with the relationship with man, one, one with another. Thou shalt honor the Lord your God, thou shalt honor your mother, thou shalt honor your father. Thou shalt not lie to one another, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder. All these things, and of course covered at the end, all these things the people of Israel shouted back. As Moses read the law, the millions of Jews were shouted back, basically making a covenant. As Moses said, thou shalt have no other gods, they would say, we will not have any other gods. They made a covenant with God. And, of course, God said, okay, now that you've said this, I want you to make a sacrifice, sprinkle it upon the people, and sprinkle it on the mountain. And the covenant was made. It was sealed in blood that they were going to keep God's word. We will do it. They were afraid, but they will do it. Everything God said, we will do, it says. Now, it's interesting. That was the old covenant. 
But has God made a new covenant? Yes, he has. That new covenant, was there a sacrifice involved? And in that new covenant, was there a blood atonement made? Absolutely. So he's speaking also to those who are his through the covenant with blood. In the New Testament, we don't have the blood of animals. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the blood of his son, who, of course, the animals were symbolic of him, foreshadowing him, but they also served as a covering for sin until the Messiah would come and take away and remove the sin. So now, do we ever remember the new covenant in our worship and in our time of fellowship as a church? When do we do that? Does anyone know? Communion. Now, what are you doing, communion? Do we just take the wafer and the offering, just move on, get on with our day? Don't we have to repent of our sin before we take it? We make it clear that we should not take it in an unworthy manner. And then we are to repent of our sin and we are to mend relationships, right? We're to remind ourselves that if there's anything between a husband and wife or children or family, they are to work it out with their neighbor as God intends us to live a new life after we take it, we commit ourselves to God. It's sort of like a renewal of the new covenant again in our hearts that whatever, yes, Lord, I remember your sacrifice. I remember what you've done for me. And I remember that I ought to be what you call me to be. And so, Lord, I take this, co I take this communion. I remember my relationship with my wife and my children. And I want to be new. I want to be made right, right? And you take it, and it's a covenant and it's a sacrifice. Remember the covenant. Remember the sacrifice. And you, and you basically commit to follow the Lord again for that week. If you take it again weekly or daily or whatever. This is a commitment. So those who do that, God says, these are the ones who I'm talking about. Those who have a covenant, a sacrifice, and a blood atonement, I want to speak to you because you are in the dock. You are in the box. Now, the scene changes here. Because God is going to deal with his people without a jury, without a lawyer, without anybody, just himself. No witnesses. God doesn't need witnesses. He's, he's fair. He's good. And the earth is silent. Notice that. Earth, no one says anything, but heaven does. It says heaven praises God. The heavens above are summoned. And it says the heavens declare his righteousness. Oh, yes, the heavens know God is good. The angels know God is good, but no one on the earth says anything. Notice that kind of silence. <laughs> it's only the people of the earth who ever say, God's not fair, and God is not good. And even his own people question how good and how fair God is. And therefore, God's fairness comes into question all the time by the people of the earth. The angels in heaven, those who live in heaven, do not question that at all. They actually declare the righteousness of God. And at this point, there's a time of pause. So we'll do that right now. It's time to think and reflect what God has been saying. It's the song would have been paused. The singers would have stopped. The instruments would have stopped. And people would have thought about what they just sang for the first six verses. Is God going to judge me? Is God pointing the finger right at my heart and what's in it? And that would have been a very much a shock because people usually think of their own goodness, especially in church. Look how good I am. I came. God must be pleased. I came. Now, verse 7, after the pause, he's going to deal with the first part, the two, two charges against him. It's the sacrifice, which has to do with worship, and the second one is going to be the covenant. So the first one, this is from our study in the book of Hosea, which I encourage you to do that. In the book of Hosea, we have, I don't know, 13, 14 messages on it. The corruption of the worship of God at the time of Hosea was terrible, which is absolutely all over the place. And here it began way back then. And God reminds him, hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. This is exactly the, like the Jewish people say every day, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God is one God, Deuteronomy 6. So it's the biggest part of the prayer of Israel, the Shema. And God almost sounds like the Shema. He says, hear, O Israel, remember Israel, O my people. It's the Lord your God who's trying you. And it says, I am the Lord your God. It's exactly the way God began in Exodus 20 before he gave the law. So when God began to give the law, he first told them, 
I am the Lord your God who called you out of Egypt, who rescued you out of Egypt, who delivered you out of Egypt with my strong right hand, and I'm going to speak to you. And then he gave them the Ten Commandments. He gave them his word. Here, this psalm is almost the exact same thing. God speaks, hero Israel, I'm going to speak, I am the Lord your God, except he doesn't mention Yahweh. He says, I am Elohim, El Elohim, your God, and he's going to speak to them. He's going to speak to them first about the worship, their sacrifice, and then about the covenant. So let's deal with the sacrifice first. Every week, they had to recite the commandments and they had to renew the covenant on the Sabbath. Each time, God tells them what is wrong and they had to get things right until they uh, get closer and closer to God. And the sacrifices were made. Uh, they brought the animals to the Lord every Sabbath, every day. And what they did is that they were supposed to sacrifice them as a way to come closer and closer to God because their sins would have been removed. They had peace offerings. They had sin offerings. And it wasn't that it was wrong to do that. Look at verse 8. I do not reprove you of your sacrifice and your burnt offerings. They're continually before me. I shall take no young bull out of your house, no male goats out of your folds. I've, I've told you to sacrifice them. I am not reproving you because of the sacrifices. I am not reproving you because you're doing this. I'm reproving you because of your motives. Of your motives. Now, in Hosea chapter 4, verse 4, uh, God reminds them, let no one make a complaint and let no one reprove, for my complaint is against you, O priest. Hosea 4.4. 4. They were doing something wrong. They thought that by doing sacrifices, they were doing God a favor. They were doing God a favor. Ain't I a good Jew? Ain't I a good person? I'm sacrificing for God. He needs them. He told us to sacrifice them. So I conclude that God needs these sacrifices. They're for God. Look what God says. I take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds. Every beast is mine of the forest. They're mine. The cattle of a thousand hills is mine. I don't need animals. I don't need sacrifices. Were the sacrifices for God? No. He didn't need them. What does God need? Nothing. By the very sentence that we say he's God, he is absolutely self-sufficient. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need the animal sacrifices. It's like in paganism, this is paganism. Paganism says, well, there's a deity and then there's me. There's something the deity needs. There's something I need. I'll make a deal with the deity. I'll give him what he wants. I'll get what I want. We'll make a deal. And everybody's happy. And this was paganism. This was the culture that which the Jews lived at the time. The Canaanites did it. The Greeks did it. In fact, even to this day, in Hinduism and Buddhism, you bring sacrifices, you bring food, you bring whatever to the altar, and because the idea is they need it. They need food, they need something, and therefore I need something too. I need luck, I need money, I need fortune, and therefore they make a deal. And so therefore when I make a deal with God, he's obligated to give me something back, and this has got what got into Israel, right? When we give to God, right, they thought God is obligated to give us something back. God needs this, and God is grateful, and he's going to show his gratitude toward me by this transaction, and now he's going to give me something back. So I'm supporting God. See how it works? I'm supporting God by my sacrifices. And it's very similar to what Paul addresses to the church or to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that people will have a form of religion, a form of godliness, but denying its power, meaning that they had misunderstood what the sacrifices were about. And Asa was a very faithful writer here. And he's very much writing to a people that were so committed to sacrifices, it was at the heart of the religion. It was the heart of, you have a whole book in the Bible about sacrifices, Leviticus. You would think that they would have gotten it. The whole thing is about atonement. But they misunderstood it. They thought they was, it was for God. They thought it was for God. Now, God owns it all. He tells them, I don't need a penny from you. I don't need money from you. 
He's God. And if we ever get into the trap uh, that we're offering something because God needs it, we misunderstood our faith. We misunderstood the whole thing. Every bird is mine, the Lord says. Look at verse 11. Every bird of the mountains is mine. Everything that moves is on the field. On the field is mine. It's basically saying, not only are they mine, but I take care of them. Remember the Lord said that not a sparrow falls without the Lord knowing? He takes care of the animals, takes care of the birds. Cattle of a thousand hill, you can't, need, can't give me anything. If I wanted an animal, I can just go get them. Because they're mine anyway. If I wanted a bull, I can just go to Bashan, because that's where the cattle was, the, the, uh, the bulls of Bashan near the Golan Heights. That's where they were kept. And I could just get them for myself. I take care of them. Verse 12, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. If I were hungry, God says, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all that it contains. It's a Hebrewism to say how absurd it would be for God to call on you and says, hey, I'm hungry. Can you make me a sandwich and bring it over? Because God says, it's absurd. I, I don't need anything. I wouldn't tell you if I need it. If I, do, if I actually really needed it, I wouldn't depend on you. That's what God is saying. How absurd to depend on man, God says. He wanted their hearts to understand that God did not need them. God didn't need anything. God didn't need anybody. So the natural question is, why do it? The natural question is, and why have the sacrifices, right? By the way, these are pictures of the ancient world. This is from the Greek world, that they would bring animals to their gods. And the idea was, my God needs them. He needs something. He's hungry. He's doing something. And therefore, he needs me to do the sacrifice thing. It was very common. In fact, even to this day in Hinduism, our deities depend on us to bring food. You know, they're hungry, so, I, you know, we got to bring it to them. And so they do it, and they do it, and in Buddhism, and it's the same thing. It's the same, same thing. So God says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The world is mine and all that it contains. Now, remember this. Jesus says, I will build my church. I will build my church. And all these false theologies today that God somehow needs us to, to bring about the kingdom of God, to build the kingdom of God, uh, to build his church, per se, like if it was up to us. Now, God will use us, and God loves to use us, but God can build his kingdom without me and without you. God can build this church, and God could run this church without me. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. He wants to use us, but God is very capable of building his church and setting up his kingdom. And I don't need any, I don't give anything to, to God that he actually needs. It actually, uh, what he, uh, what he commands me to give him, it doesn't, it's not for him, but it's actually something for me. And this is the critical part about sacrifice. Who were the sacrifices for? It was for the children of Israel. Why? Because they had sinned. They had sinned against God. And the hypocrisy that they were sacrificing and still continuing on their sin, that's going to be the second part of this, uh, of this chapter, was an absurdity that they had the sacrifices, they repeated the covenant, and they went away and broke it right away. It was an absurdity. We'll get to that in a moment. But the idea here is, I don't need your sacrifices. The sacrifices, the sacrifices honor God. It's not for me. It actually is, it's not for him. It's for me in order to honor him. And the reason why I bring him is to exalt him and honor him and praise because he is worthy of it. But the sacrifices, I need them. I need the sacrifices in order to approach a holy God. Remember, the sacrifices in the Old Testament cover their sin temporarily. They can approach God now on the basis of their sin being covered. God didn't need them. They needed them to approach God. God provided a way for them to come to him through the tabernacle, the sacrifices, which, of course, all pointed to the Messiah, to the Messiah Jesus. And so when I give to God, it does something to me. I humble myself, honoring him. My selfishness goes away. I honor someone greater than me that I need to worship. It actually 
affects my heart in the reality that I need God. He doesn't need me. I need him. Verse 13. Shall I eat the, uh, the flesh of bulls or drink the, bo- uh, the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will rescue you and you will honor me. And you will honor me. God says, I am not hungry like men. I don't need to eat the flesh of animals. Verse 13. I don't need to do that. I'm not a man. These are not for me. But I want you to come to worship. Verse 14. I want you to sacrifice with the real meaning of sacrifice. The real meaning of sacrifice wasn't just to do the ritual, the mechanical thing. Here's the blood of bulls and goats. It was to bring about the praises and honor of God. In fact, we worship God. True worship is out of debt. Out of debt. Meaning that I cannot repay what God has done for me. If I gave all of my money and I gave every penny that I ever made in this world, I can never even bring a down payment to what Jesus has done for me on the cross. And when he hung there for me, it gave me the freedom to come to him and to be free from sin. I owe him everything. I owe him my life. I owe him my resources. I owe him my talent, my intelligence, or lack thereof. I owe him everything. And therefore, I come to him and offer him a sacrifice of praise and worship and adoration out of debt, out of gratitude, right? When I give God to, when I give, it is paying a debt that I owe, right? When I give to God, I don't give to get, right? That's paganism. When I give to the Lord, whether it's money, whether it's resources, whatever it is, I don't give to get something back. Paganism does that. I give to get. He needs my money. I give it to him. We make a deal. He blesses me later. I give because of what he's done for me. I give because I've already received more than I could ever imagine. Salvation and his son and the Holy Spirit in me. That's more than anybody could ever, ever give me. And therefore, it's out of gratitude. The second thing is why we worship God is to dedicate ourselves to God. Look what it says. Fulfill or pay your vows to the most high God. It was an oath. It was a promise. Now, in the New Testament time, the Romans knew quite well what this was. They would come, and as a soldier, you would owe, you take an oath, a promise to Caesar or to the Roman Empire that you were going to dedicate yourself to Rome and to the defense of Rome. Well, guess what we do every time we take the Lord's Supper? We dedicate ourselves to the Lord. That's what's such a... It's such an honor, it's such a worship, it's such an important part of our fellowship is to take the Lord's Supper together because we're dedicating ourselves. like taking an oath. I realize what Jesus has done for me. I know what God's pleased and I dedicate myself to what pleases him. Here I am, Lord, send me. And you do that every time you take communion, whether you realize it or not. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter as well. Hebrews chapter 13, which really speaks about the Old Testament as well. It's it's steeped into the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Through Jesus, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. See, there's still a sacrifice. It's a praise. That is the fruit of the lips that give thanks to, uh, thanks to his name. It's for thanksgiving, out of gratitude. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for which with such sacrifices God is pleased. That would be a great verse to remember. Do not neglect doing good and sharing. It goes right into our selfishness. It deals with the heart, right? When we... Give to God, it deals with our selfishness. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, another sacrifice. A sacrifice of praise. What else do we have? Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. 
And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that is which is good and acceptable and perfect. So again, we're to give to God out of debt, gratitude, out of dedication, worship to God, spirit of dedication. And then the third part is a dependence on God. It really teaches you how to depend on God. It is one thing to be here and to pray. It's another thing to call upon his name during the week. Look what it says. Call upon me in the day of trouble. It's one thing to pray to God when you're in church. You do that. Everything's good. Song is, song is singing. Right? Birds are chirping. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Israel was doing all these sacrifices. Asaph was singing. Everybody prays. But what happens on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? If we really worship, there is a debt, there's a dedication, and there's a calling upon him. And there's a little bit of an interesting thing. In the day of trouble, there will be a day of trouble. There will be a day that is coming, a tribulation that is coming, in which we will call upon his name. But God is telling us, look, you can call upon me now. You can call upon me then. And I will rescue you, it says. Enjoy his deliverance. We can enjoy his deliverance. That God will bring us back. And when he brings us back, we will sing praises and we'll sing honor to the king. It's sort of like a feedback loop. You know what a feedback loop is? You do one thing, you do another, and then that one leads you back to the first one and it goes back again. So out of when we enjoy his delivering, guess what? We come back and we worship out of a gratitude because he just delivered us during that week. And then that causes our dedication to come forward. We depend on him. Then we call upon him again and he delivers us and we come back again. An attitude of worship and praise. I owe him everything. And that's what God is telling us. If you're faithful to me, God says, I'll be faithful to you. There's a relationship there. It's not, it's not a sacrificial system like I need it. God needs it and I need it too. We'll make a deal. But it's more of a relationship. If you truly have your heart stayed on God, then that desire will be there to please him, to pray. And when we pray, God answers our prayers. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see that God is like, he's inviting us. There's no, there's no talk here about, well, if you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you can come to me. He says, just call upon me. You obey me, you honor me, call upon me. And that's what was wrong with the nation of Israel. They didn't feel they owed God anything. They were just there because God needed them. God needed a favor, you know? It's like when people call me and say, I went to church. I said, well, you didn't do it for me, did you? I hope you did it for you. Because that's what you did it for. You know? Hey, we served last week. Great. Praise the Lord. God noticed. He'll honor you. Make sure you keep doing it. Keep serving the Lord. They felt God owed them a blessing for coming. Oh, we're doing all these sacrifices. God, look how good we are. Look how good we've been. And they felt, and, and they didn't feel like they should dedicate themselves to God. They felt God should do that for them. God should be faithful to me. He's, you know, I'm doing all these for God. He's depending on us. And they felt God was depending on them. And that's why they came. They got the whole thing wrong. And by the way, that's religion. That's religion in a nutshell. You do this for God. He needs you. He needs your money. He needs this. He needs you to be here. He needs all these things. And he's depending on you. He's depending on We're going to go bankrupt. He's depending on you. God's government. He's got the notice from the government. He's about to lose it all. He needs you. I've seen. I heard it. And it makes me sick. Verse 16. Second half now. The covenant. And now we're taking us back to Mount Sinai. Oh, the wilderness. God says, oh, remember the Ten Commandments. And they're very specifically here. He's going to mention three. See if you can pick them up. And their sacrifices were all wrong. They looked at it as favor. But their covenant was wrong because what they said on that day that they dedicated themselves to the Lord, they did not keep it. So on the day that they came together on the Sabbath, they did not keep it throughout the week. It was just words, just words. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell me my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? 
For you hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you're pleased with them. When you, and you associate with adulterers, you let your mouth loose an evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silence. You thought I was like you. I will reprove you and state the case and order before your eyes. Wow, God is not messing around. He's basically saying, you brought things, you put things in your mouth and you say them and you have no desire to keep what you just said. It's like what Charles Spurgeon told his congregation one day. He says, the place that Christians lie the most is at church because they sing songs with no desire to ever lift a finger to do them. And boy, that is so true, isn't it? You can sing a song, you know, refiner's fire, my heart's one desires to be holy. And you say it, and you might mean it, and you sing it, and then you get out of this place of worship, and you go out, and you have no desire to be holy anymore. Right? Like, God, I, you know, I give my all in all, and you have no desire to give God anything. And you keep everything. And that's what Charles Spurgeon was reminding us, and we should remind ourselves, is what we're singing, is it true? Is it better not, it's better not to sing them if we really don't mean them? Now, we ought to sing to the Lord and worship the Lord, but if we can't be honest with God, then why recite the commandments? And that's what the children of Israel were doing. Every week they recited the commandments. They had to do it. Here's the covenant. Remember the covenant. I'm the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, blah, 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 blah. First commandment, second commandment. They, and they went away, and they began to act completely different. First of all, they didn't like to be disciplined. By the way, when they were in the, uh, in the wilderness... It was God bringing them to himself. So they, they got the whole thing wrong. They thought it was just some kind of punishment, but it was God bringing them to himself. That's what it says in Exodus. He brought him to himself. But during the covenant, regarding the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, they broke the promise. They broke the promise. You don't like discipline. You don't like to be disciplined. You don't like being told what to do. You resent the words that people tell you, and you forget all about them, it says. You have, uh, verse 17, you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. That means you let them go. You forget about them. You just put them behind you, one ear out the other, we will say in our euphemism. It's the same thing. You hate being told you must do this. Children of Israel did not like that. They didn't like to be reminded that they had to keep God's word. It says you hate discipline. It says, you also rebel. You enjoy the company of people who break God's word. Now, this is interesting. You might not break them yourself. You might say, Pastor, I'm not doing any of that. You might not break them yourself, but you're, you are with those who break God's word, and you have no problem with it. And you see how God holds us accountable for this. You might say, well, I don't go around with, yeah, I, I don't go around and commit all these sins, but you sit around with all of them, and you don't correct them. You don't remind them of God's word. You laugh at their jokes. You laugh at what they say. When your friends act sinful, you act like them. When your friends act against God, you join them, or you give approval. That is as bad as breaking them, God says. Wow. Isn't that a call to repentance to the church? Church, you might not do all the things that the world does, but you know, you laugh. Turn on the idiot box, like my friends call it, and you just enjoy their blasphemies against God. You just enjoy two homosexual couples. Just, oh, they're so funny. They're so great. That's, that's so, ah, that's a great. They should get an Oscar for that. Why? We enjoy. You see a thief, you put up with them. You see an adulteress, hey, good, good stuff, man. You associate with adulterers. You might not do them. You might not lift a finger to do them, but you enjoy their approval. You enjoy their company. Boy, isn't that amazing, isn't it? It's even in the church. It's even in the church. that You know, sin in the church, and people just go, hey, man, forgive and forget. Who am I to judge? That was the Corinthian problem. It's in the Bible for that reason. It's the Corinthian problem. You're way too permissive, God says. You're way too permissive. You don't deal with the sin. You just let it go. Pretend nothing's happening. You give hearty approval. 
When you see a thief, you're pleased with them. You let your mouth loose in evil. Now, this are the sin that is in every church. Gossip. And it's just as bad as the other sins God has mentioned. Do you notice that? God said, well, I'm just going to, eh, this is not that bad. I'm just kind of, you know, parse some words here. You let your, your mouth lose in evil. Your tongue frames deceit. You, see, you sit there and speak against the brother, right? Gossip. You you're bring the sacrifices. You do your thing. You say the right words. I'm going to keep all of God's word. All right, you go outside and you just lambaste your brother, he says. The sin of the mouth is as serious as a lie. The sin of the mouth is as serious as any other sin. Lies, hypercriticism, gossip, spreading rumors, so discord. Gossip is a beast. Gossip is a beast, and it's so hard to tame. Once it's out, you can't contain it. Once you've said it, you can't stop it from, from spreading around. And it's such an interesting thing. It devours. It devours. And you sing so well on Sunday, we would say. Oh, you lift up your hands. And then you go outside and, boy, you attack everybody. You attack the pastor. You attack the leaders. You attack the congregation. you just going off and criticizing everybody. God says, those are, I heard those words, God says. And I'm holding you accountable. But look what it says. Now consider... Uh, verse 21, these things I've done and I kept silent, says the Lord. Now, why did the Lord keep silent? Why God just didn't slam that person right there and then? God knew about it. God, God heard it. Should have smashed him. I would have done that, right? No, because God, it's long suffering. Look what it says. You thought that I was like you. You thought I was given approval. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. God is long suffering. He's patient. For what purpose? To give people time to repent. He gives them an opportunity to repent because he's so long-suffering. That's what Peter says. That's the point. I charge you with hypocrisy, God says. You have unclean lips and you have spoken against your brother. You have spoken against your people. I love this story. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Talk about clean, unclean lips. And we all have some fault in it. And Isaiah was a man just like us. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Isaiah was a prophet. He was in King Uzziah's court. He was probably related to the king. But in the, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He lived in a palace. He saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The seraphim stood above him, each having six wings with two covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold tremble at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. And then I said, woe is me, I am ruined. I am done. I see God. I see God for who he really is. Not through the eyes of the priest, not through the eyes of my friends. I see the Lord. King Uzziah died, and now I see God. For whatever reason, there was a, an impediment in Isaiah's life. He couldn't see the Lord until Uzziah died. Once Uzziah died, then Isaiah entered the temple, and he said, Wow, God is more awesome than I ever thought. He is so majestic. He is so holy, 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 and I am unholy, unholy, unholy. And when unholy and holy meet, there's an explosion, and I die. Woe is me is a sign of judgment. I am done. I am going to be judged. Because I am a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips. This was the issue with Israel, just like the psalmist said. You speak against this person, you spread rumors and discord and, and hatred against your brother. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies, the one with the seraphim flew to me. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the coal in his hand and had taken it from the altar with the tongs. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. And he became known as the prophet with the with the scorched lips. And how amazing was this that Isaiah saw the Lord 
and his lips were clean. And he says, I get it now, Lord. My iniquity is cleansed. And now he could say, send me, Lord. He can now go. We all need that coal on our lips, by the way. You might say, oh, Isaiah needed it. What a man. He was probably speaking bad things. We all have in somewhere capacity. And we need the touch of God's coal on our lips to burn it off of what we've spoken against other people. And he was talking to his own special people, right? He's not talking to the world. He's talking to his people. Go back to the Psalms and we're done. Two more verses. He says, God gives the answer. What should we do? What's the point of this? This is what we ought to do. Verse 22. Consider this, you who forget God. You who forget God. You know, when I do all those things, I'm forgetting the Lord. Why do I sin? Why do I attack others? Why do I gossip against others? Why do I, for, why do I um, think God is needing me? I do that because I forget God. I forget who he is. And it says, don't forget me or I will tear you in pieces and there'll be none to deliver you. Now, this is quite a, quite a judgment. This is in Hosea chapter 13, almost the exact same quote, Hosea 13 verse 7. God warned them that if they didn't repent, he would come like a lion to tear them. It's one thing if Satan attacks you, God can protect you and deliver you. If God is the one who's coming after you, what hope do you have? None. It is a frightful thing, says the book of Hebrews, to fall into the hands of the living God. And this is a warning to his people. Lest I come to you, if you don't repent, I'm going to come to you. Isn't that almost what the book of Revelation to the seven letters to the seven churches were all about? Five of them got that news. Two of them did not get that news. Five of them says, unless you repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Unless you repent, I'm going to throw you in a bed of sickness. Unless you repent, something really, really terrible is going to happen to you, and you're going to be removed. I'll even remove your name from the book of life. It is a dreadful thing that God will come in that way. But yet, that is our God. He is the one who is just and righteous and good, and he won't put up with my sin. In fact, my sin is just as grieving to God as the sin of the immoral or the homosexual or the Satanist. It's just as grieving to God. The thing is, I know better. They don't know. And God says, I'll hold you accountable because you come and you worship me and you know, and you have the sacrifices of Jesus, you have the sacrifice of Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit. How can he hold me accountable to a higher, higher degree? Verse 23, God offers a solution, and this is wonderful. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. When we give honor to the Lord out of a debt, a gratitude, and worship, I give, I give him glory. The word honor there is kabod, to, to honor him. To glory, to literally, if you really want to be literal, is to take them heavy. You know how we have a thing in, in English, we say in English, don't take that person so light. Or like in sports, oh, that team took them lightly, you know, that kind of thing. Or a boxer took that guy lightly. It comes from that biblical idea. You take someone heavy, they're valuable to you. They're honorable to you. That's what God's saying. You who take me at my word, you who take me and value me, Offer it, and to him who orders his way aright, I will show him the salvation of God. No false lips, no unclean lips. If we do that during the week, God says, I will show you my salvation. You will speak and worship my praise. It's going to be awesome. Now, did this happen? Was this an event that Asaph lived through? Well, this never really happened as Asaph saw it, he saw a vision. This was a seer. This is a warning from God to his people. Asaph must have written that down. We have the song. He quickly wrote it, and he put a song to it. And he says, we're going to sing this song next week. And you can imagine people worshiping the next, day, next week. All right, Asaph got a new song. That'd be a great song. <gasps> what? You did that? And you're doing that. Oh. And there must have been people there that had the right heart. And they might have had their heads down because they were doing that. And see, God was speaking to them. 
And the next time they got together, they sang it in the congregation. And it was so convicting, so convicting that it changed people's hearts. And next week, we'll, we'll, we'll study it because it touched people in the religious world. It touched people morally. It even touched the political leaders. How do I know that? This psalm is a, has a sequel. And we'll study that next week. It touched a man's heart so deep that he wrote a song about his sin and he came public with it. And it's no coincidence that that psalm is one of the most beloved psalms in the whole Bible. And it caused the man to worship and praise God and to say, God, you don't delight in offerings. I know that. Otherwise, I would bring it. Lord, you don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. Otherwise, I will, I will bring it to you. But Lord, a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, you will not despise. This was after he heard Asaph Psalm 50, that a young man wrote another song exposing his sin. We'll see that next week. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, may we take it to heart what you just said. May we take what you just said, Lord, so deep into our soul that it'll change us and mold us. Lord, that we are that person that you spoke about here. We're all guilty of it, Lord, in some way or capacity. We've all spoken against you, against other people. We've been hypercritical. We've been gossipy. We've been attacking others, Lord. We've been saying the right things, Lord God, but our hearts have not followed through in the right behavior. And Lord, and you know it. You know it well together. Lord, you know that sometimes we are not pleased with you and what you've done in our lives. And we'd rather walk with others, Lord, who don't follow you and worship you. And we walk with them, Lord, and we're pleased with them. And that ain't right. That is not right. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us just like the psalmist said. And give us, Lord, a renewed spirit within us. Cleanse us. Make us right. We thank you for this man, Asaph, Lord, who was honest and who was stirred in his spirit to write something that it might have been even uncomfortable for him, but he had to write it because it was shown to him by you for them and for him. Lord, I praise you and thank you that you uh, warn us and you tell us that we ought to be right, that we ought to be made right by you. I thank you, Lord, that the true meaning of the law, the true meaning of sacrifice is Jesus, him hung on a cross for our sins, that who he told very religious people, the Pharisees, he told them that they are to do the heavier matters of the law, justice, mercy, righteousness, that they are to seek those things because that's the acceptable sacrifice. That's the fulfillment of the whole entire law was to love God and to love others. Thank you for showing that, Lord God. Thank you for bringing this psalm to our attention. Maybe it's a psalm that many times we don't read it or we haven't studied it, but it's a psalm that points to the problem, the problem of our hearts, the problem of religion, the problem of trying to think, Lord, that you need something from us as if it was a need that you have. We need you, Lord. We're the ones who are in desperate need of you, of your cleansing, and of your righteousness. And so, Lord, we honor you today. Help us to sing, Lord God, not just today, but for the rest of the week, a song of praise. Lord, that the songs in our hearts and in our mouth will match the attitude and behavior of our lives. And so we honor you today, Lord. Do that in us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.